Welcome to the Woo Woo Way podcast. My name is Zeb Rice. Today's podcast is an edited version between George Falcon and one of his students. But since this is the first podcast in the series, you may not know who George is or what this podcast is all about. So before I introduce the lecture and hand it over to George, I thought I would do a brief introduction. We begin with the statement that right here, right now, you are experiencing a perfect life. Even though this is true, when you hear me say that sentence and reflect on your own experience of life, you probably don't believe it. In fact, looking around, it seems like, to the contrary, almost everyone experiences life as a series of problems. It appears that life is spent mostly trying to solve these problems, but with occasional periods of respite in between. What most people don't realize is that there exists a series of principles that, if pl- applied correctly, can alleviate personal suffering forever. By putting these principles into action in your own life, you will increase your personal power and change your experience of life from one of lack and separation to one of abundance and connection. You will be happier, more efficient, more discerning, and make better decisions. You will be less anxious, have better health, have more fun, and discover you have more time to enjoy all these things. You will start to see that suffering is optional. You will start to experience true freedom in your life. If, in fact, right here, right now, your life is so incredibly good, why doesn't it seem that way? And how are you going to experience this truth for yourself? This podcast is devoted to explaining why the world doesn't seem this way, why suffering seems to be more the norm for most people. And the objective here is to give people the tools to take control of their lives. Primarily drawing on the lessons, stories, and lectures of wisdom teacher George Falcon, It provides the intellectual framework and spiritual context for mastering the self. So you might ask, who was George Falcon? George was a Southern California-based spiritual teacher and mentor who spent his time lecturing, leading meditation retreats, and guiding students on their spiritual paths. He stands as a uniquely accessible and powerful teacher today because of his mix of talents and experiences. In addition to being an enlightened being with advanced skills in the martial arts, He had decades of grounding in the academic worlds of neuropsychology, contemporary physics, and comparative theology. This is really what sets him apart. A great many teachers have provided insights into how a human being can achieve lasting happiness, health, and abundance in their lives, whether it is the Eastern sages specializing in in Buddhist or Hindu teachings, New Age spiritual promoters, contemporary self-help gurus, or simply the devout or mystically inclined spiritual masters or saints from one of the world's many religions. Human society has seen many of these great teachers. Unlike with George and a very few others, however, those seeking a better life today or a method of self-mastery often find when they follow one of these teachers that there is something crucial missing. We could devote a whole podcast to this subject, and perhaps we will, but for now, I will very briefly cover some of the major drawbacks of these different traditions and teachers versus George. With the Eastern masters or new age movements, for example, many in the West are unable to authentically connect with the teachings, or if they do, are unable to sustain a practice due to the cultural gulf that separates these teachings from a typical Western student's experience. Another challenge with these traditions is the concept of enlightenment, which can easily come to just replace one form of wanting with another. Contemporary Christian, Jewish, or Islamic religious traditions are also falling short for many of us today. The violent acts or intolerant views held by many of these traditions are so off-putting as to negate the many wonderful teachings these traditions offer. You also have the problem of translation. Jesus' Aramaic words, for example, were passed down orally for many decades before being written down, most likely in Greek. These texts were then copied and translated into other languages, Along the way, changes in word meanings, errors by various scribes, and political pressures at key moments of editing have so distorted the source material that the original meaning is often simply lost or misunderstood. As an aside, I'll say that uh, a fascinating book on this subject called The Invention of Jesus by Peter Creswell was published a few years ago and is uh, worth a read. Finally, like the Enlightenment challenge of the Eastern traditions, the concept of places called heaven and hell similarly misleads people on a spiritual path. Another source to um, for, for another source people look to for techniques to improve their lives is the self-help industry. These teachers have the advantage of being more relevant and accessible, 
Unfortunately, what they gain in their contemporary presentation and sometimes dubious grounding in modern science, they often lose by divorcing themselves from spiritual foundations. Much more to say on that industry and, and, and the other traditions we've mentioned, but um, in, in an effort to keep it short, I'll stop there. George Falcon draws on these different spiritual and self-help strands, but without completely divorcing his teachings from modern understandings of psychology, neurology, and physics. With that sort of approach, he explains why we experience the world we, we, the way we do. He directs us to the most valuable teachings from all these traditions, and he goes one step further by providing a method for how to transform our reality for the better. This means that when George Falcon speaks about spirituality, he brings a language and an approach that is more user-friendly and acceptable to the modern ear than any other teacher that we have encountered. So that is a bit about George and how he fits into the various uh, other places you can go to find help on your path of finding lasting happiness. A couple other final things to mention. First, the recording you're about to hear, as well as the one on future podcasts, are drawn from the years of lectures he gave in the Los Angeles area and selections from private sessions with some of his students. Finally, in case you were wondering, I wanted to make a brief comment on the podcast's name. Wu Wei is a Taoist expression meaning not doing or without action in Mandarin Chinese. Wu Wu Wei means not not doing. George Falcon would use the concept of Wu Wu Wei as a way to articulate who humans really are and as an encapsulation of his methods for how one could achieve true happiness. Today's podcast is a condensed and edited version of a private conversation Nina Walton had with George Falcon. It is a good one to start with because in a very short time it captures quite a lot of George's teachings. Unfortunately, it goes by very quickly, so some of the insights might slip by those not familiar with his themes. To help the listener, I've edited the discussion and broken it up into four different parts. I'll summarize those parts and then hand it over to George. In the first part, George talks about how emotions and thoughts distort our perception of life. He discusses how much time thoughts about the past and the future occupy of our now. And if it isn't thoughts occupying our now, it is emotions associated with those thoughts or memories. Rather than what is actually happening out there in our now, it is those thoughts and emotions or the past and the future that drives our experience of reality at any given moment. He brings up the concept of planes or dimensions of existence to help elucidate this point. For example, if your consciousness is anchored in the emotional dimension, which is sometimes called the lower astral plane, just to make it sound mysterious, I guess, Thoughts are pointless or too abstract to have any power. In contrast, if you are more of a cerebral, logically-based person, so you inhabit, in a manner of speaking, the more aptly named mental plane, then someone driven by emotion seems silly and feelings seem unreal or unsuitable as a driver of one's behavior. In the second part, George goes on to say that when we lose ourselves to our thoughts and emotions, we lose our power to experience the inherent perfection of the universe. Why doesn't life seem great all the time? Why don't we feel a pervasive and lasting sense of peace and happiness? Why doesn't it seem like we have more power over ourselves? In short, George teaches that we limit our own personal power by our beliefs. And one of the biggest beliefs we have is that our thoughts and emotions are real or that they are valid measures of what is really happening out there in the world around us. A related belief is that perfection doesn't exist and that we don't have access to it even if it did. All of this often is expressed in the idea that if I don't do it, it won't get done. And think of the fear, anxiety, stress, sadness, anger, and so many other emotions that can arise as a result of just that thought. George then shifts to telling us stories. Uh, He tells us the story of Gozan and Polish Joe to demonstrate these concepts. They serve as vivid illustrations of beliefs limiting our power and creating our reality. And finally, in the fourth part, George goes more deeply into why we don't get the evidence of the truth of our power and of the intrinsic perfection of the world. He concludes with his exoneration for each of us to stay focused on simply witnessing the perfection in the world around us. Sounds easy, right? Anyway, that is quite a lot for one short lecture. In fact, George's style is to circle back to similar ideas in different ways at different times. So there are many more lectures of his to come that explain these ideas in more detail or in different ways. But here in just a few minutes, and with the aid of a couple of memorable anecdotes, we have several of George's key lessons. 
So listen out for these five key lessons. One, the idea of planes of existence. Two, the mixing up of the past and future into the now. Three, how our beliefs shape our experiences. Four, the inbuilt perfection and order of the universe. And five, how our job is to witness this, per this perfection. Okay, that's enough for me for now. So here's George. Let's take it a step further. Okay. Now, when I keep saying, honey, we've got to be detectives, we've got to be scientists, we've got to pay attention. Now, now I'm going to appeal to your reasoning ability. Does Sunday exist? Last Sunday. Not, not now, but it did. How about uh, the Thursday before Sunday? No. Last Tuesday? No. All right, now, this is an important question. Since all psychotherapy is based on memories, why? If it doesn't exist, aren't they illusions, honey? But not only that, I think an illusion means, when we use the word, well, that's an illusion, we mean it's not real. So Sunday, last Sunday is not real. Thursday is not real. Last Tuesday is not real. They're illusions, right? Yeah. Good. Not what I said. All therapy is based on the past. Yeah. So why? See, you're going to be a scientist. You're going to say, now, wow, wait a minute. So I've been plagued by this eight-year-old, what, event or memory? Memory, not the memory. event, right? Good. So now we know something about the subconscious mind. When it remembers something, unless otherwise instructed as you've just done, it brings all the emotions that were there at the time of the event. Mm -hmm. That's why the past seems real, honey. Because it brings up the emotions, right? Right now, I'm feeling whatever I was feeling then. Okay? The past does not exist. And you have to deal with them as memories. And all you're doing is reviewing your whole arsenal of memories, and yes, cataloging them in age, which is fine, but more important, you're going to put them in a deep vault, right, and say, okay, that's what happened. It has nothing to do with me now. All right, let's do the other end of the spectrum, dear. Okay. Today is Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Does Wednesday exist? No. Friday? No. So the future's an illusion also? Yeah. Then let me ask you this, as a scientist, as a detective. Why am I in turmoil about Wednesday's meeting? Wednesday doesn't exist, so it qualifies under the term an illusion, right? I wonder if the conscious rational mind does something, has the same type of ability that the subconscious mind. That being what? Thoughts are real to it. So when it starts thinking, it deals with whatever it's thinking as if it was real. Since yeah. I'm thinking about it right now, it behaves as if it's happening right now. And then the subconscious mind goes, oh, I know the feeling that goes with that. Therefore, future is real. So we say, all right, so, what is the substance of memories? Just that, memory. The emotions of what gives it reality. All right, let's go to the future. What's the substance? Mental energy. Okay? So, hopefully you'll see it in this way, okay? You know, there used to be a, a, a model that was very popular. They don't use it that much, but they would talk about the fact that you know, there was the physical plane, the lower astral, the higher astral, the mental plane, the subtle and the causal plane. Okay, so that was a popular metaphysical way of explaining things, okay? Now, the physical is obvious. The lower astral plane, they would say, and it's true, it's true. It's, we just use different words now. The lower astral plane is the plane of emotions. The higher astral plane is the plane of of desires. The mental plane, obviously, is the plane of thoughts, okay? All right, now, masters train themselves 
to be able to go to any of these dimensions, okay, and explore. Here's the trick. When you're in the physical plane, any dimension above seems invisible. Any dimension below, so if you're in the mental plane, the higher astral, the lower astral, and the physical plane seem very gross, very solid. But when you're in the mental plane, everything in the mental plane, which is ideas, are real. You can actually, you literally can hurt somebody with a thought. Okay? Because they're real. So it's like shooting a bullet. <laughs> okay? So if somebody at the mental plane is sending a thought to you, no, it's not like a bullet. You go, ah, oh, geez, that's an interesting idea. Or that's a stupid idea. It's not like, whoa, I just got hit. Okay? All right. Desire. Desires at that level, okay, are real at that level. By the way, sometimes when you're dealing with a very uh, well-established, really glued addiction, you've got to go to the higher astral plane to start to get rid of the glue. Okay. That's why they can't let go of it at the physical plane. Okay? For whatever reason, they sort of drift to that plane and the desire, the passion, whatever word you want to use is so real, they cannot fail but obey it. Okay? By the way, which would make sense to you, people who are very heady are not that emotional, huh? See, because they're dealing with over here, and so to them, emotions are kind of gross, and it's kind of like sloppy. Okay, so I'm trying to help you to see that so that you start to recognize, oh, I get it. So if the past is energized by the astral plane, oh, when I get in touch with a memory, I'm actually moving to that dimension. So when we get in touch with a memory, you just shift into the lower and higher astral plane, collectively called the astral plane. Now, the difference between the average person and a master is they do it consciously, they investigate however long they want to do it, and then they pull out of it. The average person sort of drifts in and gets battered and, and gets ejected out of there. All right. When you think, you drift into the mental plane. Okay? Now, for people who think a lot, thoughts are real. When, when you reach a conclusion, it's worthy of following it. Right? But an emotional person, honey, when they reach a conclusion, eh, they don't have to follow it, because thoughts aren't real. They just had an idea, okay, but it's, it's not real to them, okay? So, unfortunately, sometimes when they think of a consequence, it's not enough to deter them. For a person that we would call reasonable or rational, we say, well, yes, if they've come to that conclusion, their behavior is going to be guided by that conclusion, because thoughts are real. Got it? All right. So, I want you to think about that, because it's going to help you explain, oh, when I get in touch with a memory, that's why the past seems real. When I start thinking about the future, that's why it seems real. I get it. I'm drifting to the dimension in which everything in that dimension is real. Okay? So now we ask the question, what's so bad about that? Well, it's not actually that it's that bad, okay? Mm -hmm. But as soon as you move off the center, what is called now, you give up your power. Yeah. Okay? Because basically, dear, the way I've explained it to you, the past and the future, are we any different than anybody in a mental institution? But I'm trying to show you that the process really isn't different. It's just not that exaggerated, right? And it doesn't get in the way of normal functioning and, and relating to others, okay? So we don't get locked up, okay? But again, once you understand it, the real reason for avoiding it is you give up your power. All your power is connected to now, okay? See? You get out of now, past or future, you're off that connecting point. So you're giving up your power. When you're in the now, what power do you have? All of it. That's the point, honey. You have all of it. You have access to all the power in the universe. Okay? All right, so now what? 
then if that's true, okay, why doesn't it look like that? I mean, there's got to be a, a reason, right? Mm -hmm. Well, because you see, we channel, curtail, limit power by our beliefs. And that's why it seems that power comes in degrees or portions, or, okay? Nah, power is power, okay? And to the degree that you do not have the limiting beliefs, ideas, then all power is available to you. The trick is to use that amount which is appropriate for the task you're dealing with. So that's part of the mastery process. To learn how much power is required to lift that up. Otherwise it goes up to the ceiling. <laughs> so again, that's the disadvantage, honey, of dealing either with the past or the future. You're sacrificing your power. There's a degree, and by the way, later on, you're really going to understand, you're not even going to have to do that. Okay? Because in that moment that we call now, is all of organization. Okay? You will do what is appropriate at the appropriate time. So if it's, it, it's like you're sitting there and all of a sudden you say, you know, I think it's time to get dressed. And by the way, conversely, you could be sitting there going, you know, I think I've got to start getting dressed, but no, I, I don't have the sense it's going to happen. And the phone will ring, right? Oh, Nina, I'm sorry, you know, we, we have to change plans. And you go, why? Right, that's why I wasn't moved to start changing. Okay? There's another level of organization, honey. Okay? That you're going to tap into, and it's going to start to move you. You know, when we say, when we look at people, right? This is the principle of the below and the above. We look at people and we say, well, in general, rule of thumb, People, unless they're rigid, but people who are organized have a greater degree of success than people that are disorganized. Right? A business that is organized has a better chance of succeeding, in, right? Now let's universalize it. Wouldn't we suppose, honey, that the universe must have some form of order to it? There's got to be some higher degree of order, whether I can see it or not. It's secondary, okay? But there's got to be order in the universe, or it would come unhinged. When you reach a certain level of consciousness, okay, you will see the order, and then all of a sudden, the term, the laws of the universe, eternal laws. See, all of those kinds of terms begin to make sense. You say, yes, there is an order to the universe. Okay? And it's designed to work. The only thing that gets in the way is our thinking, our beliefs. So if we start out with the idea that there's an inherent universal order and that it works without me, it can include me, but it doesn't need me. Mm -hmm. like, it's going to work anyway then we can take this attitude. You know what? My primary job, if you wish, my primary role is to witness perfection happening. If in the manifestation of perfection it would be worthwhile, a value, for me to do something, I will be inspired to do it. Because, see, the, the premise of self-consciousness, okay? The premise of self-consciousness goes something like this. If I don't do it, it won't get done. All right, now let's move to another consciousness. And we hear things like, can you be still until the moment of action? Well, doesn't it imply that I would have to know the moment of action? So why start getting dressed now, right? I mean, it's it's not the moment of action. At the right time, you'll get up and start getting dressed. Now, let's move to the next level of consciousness. Okay? And now the motto is the sage. So it's identifying somebody, right? The sage does nothing. And yet nothing is left undone. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, 
Of course, of course, if I'm in self-consciousness, those two statements really don't make sense. I don't have any evidence that they work. Okay? And therefore, you see, without moving to, a, to the appropriate conscious, consciousness, I'm not going to get the evidence. Because at self-consciousness, that's not the evidence I'm going to get. The evidence is, if I don't do it, it's not going to get done. And as long as I'm in that consciousness, then I have to proceed that way. The universe is going to verify whatever beliefs you have. I think I told you the story of uh, um, Gozan, didn't I? This is good. This is good. We get to see the hand of God at work. Let's, let's review it. Uh, Gozan lived probably around 3,000 years ago, okay? And he was and is considered a great saint in the Jewish faith, okay? Mm -hmm. By people, not by him. He was very humble. Okay? And he was known, honey. He was known because whenever something wasn't perfect, he would just go, this is good, this is good. We get to see the hand of God at work here. So, the at this period of history, the emperor of uh, Babylon is going to attack, sorry, Assyria, Syria. The emperor of Syria is going to attack Israel, and the Israelis recognize that he has a far superior army, and that all he really wants is the ports, okay? Mm -hmm. Israel's not that big, okay? Mm -hmm. So they send a uh, committee of diplomats and they make a treaty with the, the emperor. They say, look, no war. You get access to the ports. We'll pay you taxes. You can even have your accountants in a temple where we collect the money. And if you agree, we will give you a gift to commemorate your greatness. He said, well, what a deal. Buddy. Don't lose any supplies. Don't lose any lives and my soldiers. And I get what I was after anyway, right? So he agrees. Yeah. So they go back home. They say, what? He's agreed. But in those days, everything worked very slowly, okay? So it wasn't any rush, okay? So they think, well, what are we going to do? Well, nowadays, honey, Israelites are considered the best stone polishers and shapers, okay? So that's because they have 3,000 years of practice they set out to get stones. They're going to polish them. And, okay, so they collect this bounty of these beautiful stones, which obviously would be worth a fortune. So now they have a practical problem. How are we going to ship these stones from Jerusalem to Damascus? So people come up with ideas. Well, we'll form an army. Well, what if somebody else forms a bigger army? Well, we'll on and on and on. You know, they're getting worried because time is going by. Somebody says, look, it's not that big of a box. He says, look, we'll get Gozan to take the box. I said, Gozan? One person? <laughs> Who's going to suspect a monk carrying this treasure? So we'll give him two donkeys, one for the box and one yeah. for him. We'll give him a stipend so he can, you know, rest at night and, you know, We'll tell him because that's the agreement. When he sees the emperor's castle, he you know, foils this flag and they'll come out and greet him. Will he do it? Oh, yes, he'll do it. He'll do anything for, it, for his country. So he says, okay. You know. Well, unbeknownst to them, honey, somebody heard the plan, looked at the design and said, you know, we'll make a box, fill it with sand, and at some point, because he doesn't know what he's carrying, he's going to be sloppy about it. Right. We just switch the boxes and off we go, right? So sure enough, that's what they do. He doesn't know. Puts it on the donkey, you know, he's traveling. He sees the castle, the stars waving the flag. They come out to get him. Okay? And all along, you know, the emperor has invited dignitaries of his time to see the treasure, the, the gift that would commemorate his greatness. Yeah. So they bring in the box, okay, and they open it up, and the emperor's looking in the box, and goes in and standing next to him, right? And they both look, right? And it's sand with rocks. And goes in and goes, this is good. This is good. <laughs> we get to see the hand of God at work here, because 
that's sand with rocks, right? <laughs> and the emperor's kind of digging, right? And he's going, oh. <laughs> heads will roll, starting with the clown next to me. And then he goes, no, they're not stupid. They're, they're not stupid, okay? I, I don't know what's going on, but they wouldn't do this. I, I still have the army, okay? And he's going through this mental process, and the captain of the guard runs in and says, Sire, sire, we're getting attacked from the south. And it comes to Gozan. Tell him to take the box up to the tower and throw the sand into the wind. The emperor is so confused, right, that he follows the command. Right? So, okay, take it up. And he just starts throwing it. The sand flies over the invading army and kills them. He's the only one Jewish that has a statue outside of Israel commemorating him. Because mm -hmm. now the emperor has now conquered, basically, you know, everything from Iraq, Iran, all the way to Syria. And, you know, he, he's now very powerful, okay? This is good. This is good. We get to see the hand of God at work here. Right? Because really what is happening, honey, is the understanding that there's an underlying perfection. If we could just switch frequencies, we would see the underlying perfection. Because the metaphysical principle is this. Your world is your report card of your beliefs. Okay. So tell me about your world, and I'll tell you about your beliefs. Tell me your beliefs, and I'll tell you about your world. So then the issue becomes, again, see, we're going to be scientists. Why isn't it obvious? Okay? See, that, that's the issue. That's the understanding. That's the rule. But, okay, it doesn't look like that, okay? Or we wouldn't have cancer patients, for instance. All right. So we're not in denial. We're scientists. We're not, you know, dysfunctional. So we say, okay. So it doesn't look like that. So we have to understand why it doesn't look like that, okay? There was this man in the turn of the century. And he was called the modern Samson, or Polish Joe. Did I ever tell you about him? A real person, okay? When he was young... He didn't have to go to school. People didn't pay attention to him because everybody knew he wasn't going to make it. He was going to die before he became a teenager, okay? Because he was so sick and parents were so poor that they really couldn't afford the medicine. So he was going to die. So why bother going to school, right? So he kind of just wandered around the town in Poland, okay? And one day as he's wandering around, he hears about a circus, so he goes out there, okay? And he sees this man lifting these huge cement blocks. He looks at that, and he's never seen anything like that, okay? And it turns out that he's the strong man of the circus, okay? So he's intrigued, okay? He starts to talk to him, okay? And he is, you know, again, he's not going to make it, so he's thin and poorly dressed, okay? But the strong man sort of took interest and pity in him, okay, that he was so inquisitive. Okay? So he's asking him all these questions, okay. The man is trying to answer the questions, and, you know, basically he says, look, it's just a matter of belief. Polish Joe just can't believe it. it's just a matter of belief. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> look at the size of the guy, you know, it's got to be that. He says, no, 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 the size is secondary, it's belief. So he didn't have anything else to do, so he used to hang around, right? And he says, well, would you teach me? He says, yeah. Well, obviously, you're not going to start with this, but okay. So we fast forward. Modern, I'm sorry, Polish Joe got to the point, honey, that the physical feats that he demonstrated were really unbelievable. Had he been in China, he would have been considered a Qigong master, okay? Mm -hmm. For instance, he could braid ropes into his hand, uh, hair, okay? and you could have five horses trying to pull in one direction, and he'd hold them at bay. Okay? I mean, just unbelievable stuff, mm -hmm. okay? So when he was asked, well, how did you do it? He would say, the vital force of the universe has no limits. 
The only limits you see is what you impose through your beliefs. Okay. Now here is a man, you know, just out there in Poland, <laughs> finally coming to that conclusion and demonstrating the tremendous things that he would do. Okay? That just were unbelievable. Well, again, the vital force is unlimited. It's only limited by our beliefs, and so it obeys our beliefs. Right. Or to put it another way, the vital force follows your intention. Now, for instance, Jesus said it this way, if you believe in the power, you will tell that mountain to move and it will move. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, again, the vital force honey, has no inherent limitations because it's got to keep the universe together. Today I introduced you to Gozan or the idea that there's an underlying perfection. Yeah. You start thinking like that, you're already going to be in the minority even more. You start thinking, wow, yeah, you know, of course it makes sense. The future doesn't exist. The past doesn't exist. All right. I'm starting to understand why it seems to exist. Okay, I get it. I understand why it seems to exist, even if it doesn't. Well, then you're already thinking in a very different way. Okay? So, for instance, on Wednesday, right, when we're, when we're reading the Diamond Sutra, and I keep saying to everybody, see, this is a production of two levels of consciousness. To whatever degree you understand what they're talking about, it implies that that consciousness, or those consciousnesses, must be already yours. They're just not dominant. You're taking off the blinders, the covers, that keep you from seeing it. All right, so what? What if somebody asked me, well, who are you? Boy, in the past I would reflexively say Nina. Now somebody asked me and I go, well, let's see. If they're like the average person, eh, let's not shock them. Let's just say I'm Nina. That'll be enough. For them. They're like the little Trent, right? That'll be it. But what if I was talking to somebody else and I said, I'm Nina. And they looked at me like, no, you're ignorant. That's what you are. You're not Nina. And go, well, look, look, I, I misread you, okay? I'm Buddha. Right. Okay. All right. You see, I mean, so you, you're going to start identifying differently, huh? See, you're going to start identifying yourself differently. So that means you let go of the inherent limitations that come with identifying yourself as me. See? So what you're saying is, A, I'm not confusing myself with my possessions, i.e. a body, or things. I'm not confusing myself with activities, right? There's teaching going on, but that's not me. I'm not even a teacher. I'm just teaching going on, right? And so I'm having better clarity on really who I am. So I'm a Buddha teaching economics. Well, okay, okay. That's who I am. Wow. I wonder if a Buddha teaching economics would have a different way of looking at economics. Well, and again, we we got to cut the race some slack, honey. It is the consciousness that's dominant, so it seems real. Okay? See, again, as we start to understand more and more, I remember I was flipping to the through the radio. I wanted to see how the Lakers had done, and I caught the literally two, three minutes of this program. Okay, so I don't know anything about the program. What just interests me was that there seemed to be an interview going on, and the interviewer is saying to the person they're interviewing. So let me get this straight. You're saying that people are not poor because they lack money. He said, right. I thought, wow, let me listen to this. You're saying that people are poor because of the way they think. He says, that's correct. Wow, I don't know who this person is that's answering the questions, but they have some insights, okay? So now, if he's correct, and he is, how shall we cure poverty? 
So, again, honey, if we think in a certain way, we will have the results of that thinking. And so you'll understand more and more how the universe works, and you say, oh, okay, so I see what's going on here, okay? My job is to witness perfection, demonstrate that I have witnessed perfection, and that's all. Because like I said, the universe is going to be perfect whether I'm here or not. So it must yeah. not need me. If it's going to function without me, and it has been functioning without me, and it's going to do it without me, so, geez, that can't be my role. That's it for today. Thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed this podcast, there are several ways you can support it. You can subscribe to it, leave reviews on iTunes or wherever you downloaded it from. You can tell your friends about it or share it on social media. If you're one of George's students or friends, my hope is that this will help you recall his teachings and inspire you to share what you learned through whatever medium is most comfortable for you. Finally, for any feedback or if you'd like to find more information on Wu Wu Wei, and George Falcon, you can go to the soon-to-be-released website, www.wuwuwei.net. And in the meantime, feel free to email me at zeb at Thanks, as always, for listening. We'll see you next time. <laughs>